Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of Field Fisher's Privacy Webinar Series, which will explore in more detail the EU's proposed Data Act. Just to introduce myself, I am Olivia Wollstone Morgan, a partner in the Privacy, Security and Information Law team here at Field Fisher in London. Thank you very much for joining us today. Presenting with me today are my colleagues Pila Azuaga, a senior associate in the same team, and Alice Graham, a solicitor in our team. Very briefly, for those of you who don't already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe and Silicon Valley, as well as in China. Our privacy team works collaboratively across all of these offices, offering strategic and actionable privacy solutions. Before we dive into the agenda, just a couple of housekeeping points. If you have any questions as we're going along, please do feel free to submit these to us using the question function on your screen. And we'll do our very best to cover as many as questions as we can at the end. If we run out of time, however, and don't get to all questions, we will make sure that we follow up with answers to any outstanding questions after the event. We'll also be sending out copies of these slides as well as a recording of the session to everybody who has registered. So please don't feel you need to make a note of everything that we discuss. A couple of other things, please do subscribe to Field Fisher's privacy blog and keep an eye out for plenty more exciting and topical webinars that are planned for the coming weeks and months. This webinar is part of a series and next up, on July the 14th, at the same time, 4 p.m. till 5 p.m. UK time, my colleagues will be covering AI, including the ICO's guidance in relation to this, compliance considerations, and AI accountability and governance more generally. Finally, if you'd like to sign up to our Get Data Protection Fit series, you can do this by subscribing to our YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's move on to today's agenda. So um, if we could have the first slide up, please. Great. So today we're going to be looking at an overview of the legislation and key definitions in the Data Act. My colleague Alice will be addressing the context of the Data Act and how this sits within the EU's wider European strategy for data. We'll be taking a look at the key topics within the Act and also um, looking at its jurisdictional scope. Next up, we'll explore the relationship between the Data Act and the GDPR. Pilar will look at some of the tensions between the differing legal regimes and concerns that have been expressed by both the European Data Protection Supervisor and the European Data Protection Board in their recently published joint opinion. The final section of our webinar will cover some of the practical challenges of the Data Act those sectors particularly impacted, as well as privacy and commercial challenges. I'll now hand over to Alice. Thanks so much, Olivia. Um, if we have the next slide, please. So we start with section one, um, and we're gonna give a overview of the legislation and the key definitions, looking at the context and background of the Data Act, the topography of the Act, and jurisdictional scope. So without further ado, let's get started. So first slide, please, in this section. Great. So if we start by looking at the broader context, the Data Act forms part of the European Union's digital agenda. Now, this is an EU initiative to promote the growth of digital services across the EU and to encourage innovation in this space. The first digital agenda saw, amongst other things, the implementation of GDPR and updates to the e-privacy directive. Also, the proposals for the new e-privacy regulation, and these are still ongoing. We're now in phase two, which is broadly scheduled to run from 2020 to 2030. And this second phase is trying to address the rapid rate of technological change and some of the societal impacts that come with it. So it has objectives such as promoting technology that works for people and also creating a fair and competitive economy. This phase two includes initiatives such as the AI Act, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act 
the Data Governance Act and the Data Act, which we are discussing today. Next slide, please. So what is the purpose of the Data Act? Broadly speaking, the purpose of the Data Act is to create a framework setting out who can access and use data generated by connected products and related services in the EU and on what basis. The idea is to try to unlock data companies generate from the use of their products and services, both personal and non-personal, which has an inherent commercial value to it. The Act is intended to promote the sharing and exchange of data between organisations, including with third parties who may not otherwise have access to that data by removing barriers to access. The Act is also designed to increase transparency as to how data is both generated and used. And some provisions such as transparency provisions rules around access and rules around data portability will look very familiar to those contained in GDPR. Next slide, please. So moving on now to look at the overall topography of the Data Act. And this hopefully will give you an idea of the structure of the law, how it all fits together, and also the key topics it is aiming to deal with. The Data Act itself is divided into 11 chapters. Chapter 1, much like GDPR, deals with the scope and the definitions of the legislation. Chapter 2 deals with business to consumer and business to business access to data and data portability rights. Chapter 3 deals with FRAND data sharing. Now, FRAND is a term often used in intellectual property law, and it stands for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. The idea being that if you are required to share data under this legislation, you should do so on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Chapter four has a ban on unfair terms for data access being imposed on SMEs. Now, this is mostly to prevent a sort of David and Goliath situation where big tech companies are refusing to share data with SMEs. Chapter five is proving to be a controversial one. And this gives EU public authorities access to data on exceptional needs. Now, more on that later. Chapter six contains a ban on obstacles to switching data processing services. Next slide, please. Chapter seven contains rules on international transfers. Chapter eight deals with open interoperability standards and the promotion of interoperability between services and data spaces. Chapter nine deals with enforcement. Now, interestingly, under the Data Act, unlike GDPR, there is no penalty based on turnover set out in the proposed legislation. Instead, enforcement is left up to member states to impose what they see as proportionate fines. Chapter 10 is a standalone provision disapplying the database right under IP law. And chapter 11 sets out the closing provisions of the legislation. Once adopted, the Data Act will come into effect 12 months later. Next slide, please. So now let's look at the detail and we're going to look in particular at chapter two, which sets out some of the key rights on access to data and data sharing. And we'll then elaborate on how some of the main definitions feed into those rights. So starting with Article three, this provides a right for data generated by use of products and their related services 
to be directly accessible to the user by default. Under Article 4, where data cannot be directly accessed by the user from the product, the data holder must make the data generated by use of the product or related service available free of charge. Now, the user should be able to easily request the data via electronic means. It's worth uh, mentioning that necessary measures should be taken to protect the confidentiality of trade secrets, especially in respect of third parties. And these measures can be agreed between the data holder and the user. However, the Act is clear that trade secrets are not excluded from data that must be made available to users. And Article 5 actually provides a right for the user to request the sharing of data with third parties, which essentially is a portability right. Next slide, please. So looking now at the definitions that feed into these rights, we can then begin to understand the envisaged data flows in more depth. Starting with user, so a user with access to data can be a natural or legal person that owns, rents or leases a product or receives a related service. The definition of data under the Act is wide and it means any digital representation of acts, facts or information, including in the form of sound, visual, or audiovisual recording. It's worth pointing out here that the legislation repeatedly refers to personal and non-personal data, and so does make a distinction between the two in some instances, personal data being that data protected under GDPR. However, the terms themselves are not expressly defined. And we see that the general rights, so for example, the general right of access we just looked at under Article 3, they simply refer to data. As with a user, a data holder can also be a natural or a legal person. And a data holder has the ability to make available certain data, including through control of the technical design of the product. Next slide, please. Carrying on with key definitions, a data recipient is a natural or legal person to whom the data holder makes data available, acting for purposes related to its trade, business, craft, or profession. Note that this is not the user of a product or related service. Now, with products, Essentially, what we are talking about is an Internet of Things, so a connected product or service that collects or generates data concerning its use and its environment, and whose primary function is not the storing and processing of data. So things like computers, smartphones and webcams are out of scope. And this is explicitly stated in the recitals. An example of a product could be something like a smart thermostat. Its primary function is controlling the temperature of your home. However, it also collects and generates data by virtue of its use. For those products to work, they are normally provided with a related service. So staying with the thermostat example, the thermostat itself doesn't generate or collect all this data. It's the software that's doing it. So the service that goes alongside this product and which is integrated in such a way that the product simply wouldn't work without it. And that's what the Act is talking about uh, when it refers to related service. Next slide, please. Finally, looking at the jurisdictional scope of the Act, 
like GDPR, it has the potential for extraterritorial effect. So running through these, it applies to manufacturers and service providers placing products and related services on the EU market. It also applies to data processing service providers targeting EU consumers, data holders making data available to EU data recipients, and to EU data recipients to whom data is made available. Therefore, a company does not have to be based in the EU to be caught by the Act. Handing over to Pilar now, who will talk more about the interrelation between the Data Act and GDPR in Section 2. Thank you very much, Annie. So, to recap, as Olivia explained in the introduction, and as Alice just went through on Section 1, the overall aim of the Data Act is to make more data available for use and set up rules on who can use and access what data for which purposes across all economic sectors in the EU. We said that the proposal covers both personal and non-personal data. More specifically, the main objective is to make more data available and facilitate data sharing across sectors and EU countries in order to leverage the potential of data for the benefit of European citizens and businesses. We will now focus on the aspects where the processing of personal data is concerned and how the proposal interplays with the current EU data protection framework. So if we move over to the next slide, please. In this section, we will go through the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor joint opinion on the proposal. And we will provide an outline of the main concerns describing the proposal. Next slide, please. So, as some of you might know, last month, um, the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, and the European Data Protection Board, I'm going to refer to them as the EDPS and the EDPB going forward, published a joint opinion on the proposal. In a nutshell, the key points under the opinion can be summarized as described in this slide. So, the EDPB and the EDPS welcome the proposal and the efforts made to ensure that the Data Act does not affect the current data protection framework. They maintain that the aspects involving personal data under the proposal are of particular importance for the protection of individuals' fundamental rights and freedoms. They welcome Recital 7, where it is explicitly mentioned that the Data Act complements union law on data protection and privacy, in particular the GDPR and the Privacy Directive. But they have made it clear that additional safeguards are necessary to avoid lowering the protection of fundamental rights to privacy and to the protection of personal data. So if we move over to the next slide, please. We will now focus on the main concerns raised by the EDPB and the EDPS. Um, they have basically split this opinion into three main sections or areas of concern. These are the rights to access, use and sharing of data, the obligation to make data available in case of an exceptional need, and implementation and enforcement of the Act. We are now going to dive deeper into each of these concerns in the following slides. Next slide. Okay. So, as we said, the first concern has to do with the rights to access and how data is used and shared. And this poses a series of questions with three similarities. The EDPB and the EDPS stress the need to ensure that access, use and sharing of personal data by users other than data subjects, as well as by third parties and data holders, should occur in full compliance with all the provisions of the GDPR and the Privacy Directive. In order to make this happen, a number of questions arose from the proposal. And this translates into the need to recommend legislators to put additional safeguards 
in respect to a number of key topics. We'll go through them shortly, but um, to summarize, these are surrounding data minimization, automated decision making and profiling, and data portability. And these recommendations are also due to the unclear scope of the rights and obligations to access to, share, and use data by data holders, users, users as non data subjects, and uh, third parties or recipients later on in the proposal. So, over the next slide, we will go over each of these concerns. Um, as we said earlier, there are concerns about the potential overlaps between the Data Act and the Data Protection Framework. As Alice mentioned earlier, a user is not always a data subject. It can be an organization. Um, there might be uncertainty as to when data subjects' rights apply. Users and data subjects should be clearly differentiated. Similar considerations apply to the making available of data to third parties upon request of a business user. Therefore, to achieve an effective empowerment of individuals with regard to their personal data, the concept of user needs to be integrated and specified in the proposal by adding in the definition of users and the data subjects, clearly differentiating situations where the user is the data subject from where the user is not. And finally, data generated by the use of a product or related service shall only be made available by the data holder to the third party. Only where the conditions or all the conditions and, and rules provided by data protection legislation are complied with. So specifically here, we are talking about gathering valid legal basis as per Article 6 of the GDPR, and were relevant the conditions of Article 9 of the GDPR and even um, Article 5 of the Privacy Directive. Now, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, the next concern is decision making and profiling. So, in this aspect, um, the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor recommend to include clear limitations or restrictions on the use of personal data generated by the use of a product or service by any entity other than the data subject. So particularly where data is likely to allow precise conclusions concerning the private lives of the individuals concerned. Um, the EDPB recommends whenever profiling or automated decision making is involved, that it should be done under the basis of Article 6 and Article 22 of the GDPR. We have already referred to Article 6, but as a remind, reminder, in short, Article 6 covers the lawful basis for processing, and Article 22 establishes um, that individuals have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated um, processing. If we move on to the next slide, please. So further to the concerns already discussed, uh, the EDPB and the EDPS highlight um, data portability and data minimization. So some of you might know already that under data protection law, uh, data minimization is a principle, which means that a controller should limit the collection of data to what is directly relevant and necessary to accomplish a specific purpose. Data portability, on the other hand, is a right which allows individuals to obtain and reuse the personal data for their own purposes across different services. It allows individuals to move, copy, or transfer personal data easily from one IT environment to another in a safe and secure way without really affecting its usability. The EDPB and the EDPS consider that in order to promote data minimization, products should be designed in the least privacy intrusive way as possible. Data holders should 
also limit as much as possible the amount of data leaving the device, for example, by anonymizing data. This is necessary to strengthen control by the data subjects on their personal data. And it's important to mention here that the right only applies to information an individual has provided to a controller. This means that in accordance with data protection law, only the data subject can request the data in such form. If we move uh, to the next slide, please. Lastly, um, to conclude this first set of concerns, the EDPB and the EDPS stress that data protection law must prevail. As opposed to other legislative instruments under the EU digital agenda, which um, Alice described earlier on, such as uh, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act does not cover this provision, and the opinion states that this should be made clear in order to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals. So this would cover the first set of concerns surrounding uh, the rights access, use, and share of data. Now, if we move over to the next slide, please. The second point of concern, as we mentioned earlier, is with respect to the obligation to make data available in case of an exceptional need. If we move to the next slide, please. So, as regards to Chapter 5 of the proposal, um, the EDPB and the EDPS have deep concerns on the lawfulness, necessity and proportionality of the obligation to make data available to public sector bodies and union institutions, agencies or bodies in case of exceptional need. And now taking a look at each of these concepts, um, lawfulness requires valid grounds under the GDPR. So again, we mentioned them earlier, these are known as the lawful basis for processing personal data. Necessity means that the data must be necessary for the purpose of the processing. And proportionality means that only personal data, which is adequate and relevant for the purposes of the processing, should be collected and processed. Proportionality restricts authorities in exercise of the powers requiring them to strike a balance between the means used and the intended aim. In the context of fundamental rights, uh, such as the, right to the protection of personal data, proportionality is key for any limitation of these rights. The EDPB and the EDPS observe that in the circumstances justifying the access are not narrowly specified and consider it necessary for the co-legislators to define much more strictly the cases of exceptional need. Finally, finally, they consider that certain public sector bodies and union institutions, agencies and bodies should be excluded from the scope of Chapter 5. As Alice mentioned um, in the outline of the chapters, this is controversial as data should only be made available in accordance with the powers provided by sexual legislation. If we move on to the next slide, please. So the third point of concern falls towards the implementation and enforcement of the Act. If we move on to the next one, please. So, this relates to the risks of fragmented and incoherent supervision when it comes to implementation and enforcement. The opinion highlights that operational difficulties might result from the designation of more than one competent authority responsible for the application and enforcement of the proposal. The EDPB and the EDPS ask the co-legislator to all or co-legislators to also designate national data protection supervisory authorities as coordinating competent authorities under the, this proposal. And they are of the opinion that considering that the GDPR applies when person, personal and non-personal data 
in a data set are inextricably linked, the role of data protection authorities should prevail. That is why, under the opinion, they recommend including, including a reference to the European Data Protection Supervisor as the competent authority for the supervision of the whole data. Um, so, this would be the end of Section 2, um, where we have covered the joint opinion of the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor and the main areas of concern. Now, if we move on to the next slide. Um, we are heading into section three now, and here we will um, go over the practical challenges of the Act. Um, with any new piece of legislation, there will always be challenges in terms of getting to grips to the provisions, the potential impact and the practicalities of compliance. The EDPB and the EDPS clearly have a number of concerns over the potential privacy implications um, of the Data Act. And um, we are now going to consider some of the practical challenges we the Act may pose for entities within the scope, both commercial and privacy specific. So in this section, we will go through the sectors particularly impacted, the privacy challenges and the commercial challenges. In theory, um, the Data Act is designed to be uh, sector neutral. Uh, however, the provisions will arguably um, have the most impact on three main types of products and related services. And these are Internet of Things, Internet of Bodies, and cloud service providers. If we move on to the next slide, please. Um, we touched on what types of products and related services uh, this might include when we covered the definitions earlier. Uh, but to give a quick overview, uh, Internet of Things technologies include everyday objects intended to send and receive data. Examples are popular devices such as smart home appliances like smart TVs, smart kettles, or smart home assistants like Amazon Alexa or Google Home. Internet of bodies includes devices which are attached or embedded to a human body. There are three main types which can be classified as body external, such as a wearable tech like smart watches that can monitor our health, for example, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Body internal, things like pacemakers, um, smart uh, contact lenses, or even digital pills. And body, and body embedded, like um, microchips, which are embedded into the body of human beings. Um, cloud service providers include services such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and we're all familiar with these. So now I return the floor to Alice, who will go through some of the main challenges, as we said, we would cover in this section. Thanks very much, Pilar. So, as Pilar spoke about earlier in relation to the EDPB and EDPS joint opinion, the Data Act provides a number of privacy specific challenges. And in practice, one of the biggest issues is likely to be this inability to neatly draw a line between personal and non personal data. Fitting GDPR together with the Data Act will definitely be a challenge. And there will likely be gray areas where data carrying obligations under the Data Act also qualifies as personal data under GDPR. Companies will essentially have to consider the two regimes in tandem. And there may be uncertainty where, for example, the data sharing obligations under the Data Act potentially clash with a controller's obligations under GDPR. Now, remember, the definition of personal data is very wide under GDPR, 
and does not need um, personal data uh, does not need to directly identify an individual. Data can still be personal data where an individual can be indirectly identified by combining it with other information. So, for example, a car number plate can be linked to other registration information to then identify the owner of that vehicle. In practice, many data sets generated by connected products and related services are likely to be mixed data sets, so a mix of personal and non-personal data. And the question is then how best to filter out that data and apply two different legal regimes to it, especially when we think that the process of anonymization is often difficult to achieve and to execute in practice. Another related practical issue is the potential conflict between, on the one hand, designing products to make data easily and continually accessible to users under the Data Act, versus, on the other, the GDPR principle of privacy by design and default. Now, this principle requires GDPR fundamentals such as data minimization, collecting the minimum amount of data needed for a specific purpose, and those such as data retention and security be inbuilt into the design of products and services processing personal data. But can privacy by design really coexist with the design implications of providing access rights under the Data Act. Next slide, please. Now, as Pilar touched upon earlier, another potential area for confusion is in relation to data subject rights. Some of the access provisions and data portability rights look very similar to the data subject rights under GDPR. However, as we've said, a user under the Data Act is not always a data subject. It can also be an organization or company. So it may be difficult for businesses to identify when they should be applying data subject rights protocol under GDPR versus facilitating access rights under the Data Act. Moving on to point four of the slide, special category data such as health data is particularly relevant for Internet of Bodies technologies, which generate large amounts of this, so things like your Apple Watch, your Fitbit. Special category data is considered more sensitive and given additional protection under GDPR. However, it is not explicitly addressed under the Data Act. Again, we see the risk of the two regimes clashing and the difficulty of compliance when dealing with data that may carry obligations under both. Finally, in relation to international transfers, the new draft law requires data processing services, namely cloud service providers, to take all reasonable steps to prevent international transfer or government access to non-personal data held in the EU that would breach EU or national law. Access to data by foreign authorities and courts would only be allowed if based on an international agreement, and the ordering country would also need to fulfill certain conditions. In other words, there are now similar types of conditions to those established for personal data following Schrems II. But again, the challenge here is interpreting when the Schrems requirements need to be implemented, as opposed to the requirements of the Data Act. As it stands, data that is not personal data currently falls outside of EU and UK international transfer rules. Next slide, please. Now, many potential challenges raised by the Data Act are, in fact, commercial ones. And we've set out a few here on this slide. 
that manufacturers and providers of products and related services bought by the Act may face. The first is an increased spend on R&D product design and compliance costs. For example, to provide things like a right of access to data for users. Manufacturers will probably need to adjust the design of products so that all data generated by their use can be extracted, stored and made accessible to an interface. Data sharing obligations may reduce the ability of organisations to protect critical IP assets, and there is definitely a risk of exposing trade secrets. There's also a risk of uncertainty as to how business sensitive data will be handled and further shared once it is disclosed. Now, we have seen there are efforts in the Act to address the protection of, data, of trade secrets. However, there is still general unease about how effectively companies will be able to protect and control business sensitive data once it has been shared with a third party, in spite of being able to put contractual measures in place. And lastly, there is uncertainty as to how the Data Act interplays with other sector specific regulations. For example, the design of medical technologies is already subject to existing sectoral legislation, such as the Medical Devices Regulation and the In Vitro Diagnostic Medical Devices Regulation. And as yet, it's unclear how the requirements of the Data Act would interact with these. Next slide, please. So to conclude this section on commercial challenges, the Data Act is definitely proving to be controversial and there has been a fair amount of industry comment and criticism on the draft legislation. To give you a flavour and some food for thought, here are a few example quotes. So the European Automobile Manufacturers Association has called it simply unworkable. The Computer and Communications Industry Association says it's well-intentioned, but in need of improvements. And finally, IBM says the Data Act should strive to remove and not institute conflicts of laws. So this wraps up section three on the practical challenges of the Data Act. And I will now hand back over to Livia to conclude and for the Q&A section. Thanks so much, um, Pilar and Alice. I hope you'll all agree, those of you listening, that that was a hugely informative and insightful session on what is proving to be quite a controversial piece of legislation, proposed legislation. So, um, I think we do have a couple of questions that have come through via the chat. So let me just take a look. Um, the first one being on UK implementation. So the Data Act is an EU piece of legislation. Do you think that the UK will be implementing something similar? Would either of you like to cover that one off, please? Sure. Um, I, I, I'm happy to cover it, Olivia. Um, so I think it's uh, kind of hard to say, given this is such a new piece of legislation that has not yet been finalized or entered into force. And uh, the UK government has consulted on its own proposed um, national um, data strategy that sets out how it plans to unlock the power of data for the UK. But the results of that consultation have not yet been published. But um, on this point, I, I think it, it is worth bearing in mind that um, due to the extraterritorial nature of the Data Act, um, any UK business targeting the EU market will still need to comply with the proposed Act. So it will impact large a large number of UK companies, irrespective of um, whether the UK adopts its own version of the Data Act or not. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, Pilar, um, and for the question. Um, so a more practical question now. 
How are businesses expected to know exactly what and how much data needs to be made available to users? Is that something that Alice or Pilar, you have any thoughts on from your research? Uh, yeah, I can take that one, Olivia. So this is definitely a, a difficult, um, a difficult question, and determining the scope of what data needs to be made available is one of the practical challenges of the Data Act. One of many, um, and unsurprisingly. It's not that clear from the legislation in its current draft form. So, as we've seen, the definition of data is very wide, and it is clear that trade secrets are within scope of what data should be made available, albeit with the possibility of placing contractual controls on this. So, it's one of those aspects of the Act that is likely to be debated extensively in the next stages of the legislative process and will hopefully become clearer further down the line. But at this point, it is probably worth highlighting that the Data Act um, at this moment in time is very much in the early stages of the legislative process um, and is likely to change as this progresses and is debated. So it's a it's a watch your space topic and we're hoping that things will become clearer um, as this process moves forward and as further guidance is released down the line. Great. Thanks so much for that, Alice. I think another one has come through on the chat. Let me just have a look. Yes. Um, how do they combine the access to the data generated by the use of products and services with potential intellectual property rights of the data holder who may be a software developer or other, which data use is core, uh, core to the business of his software or app? So I think I can... Uh, provide a couple of comments on this one I think you know I think essentially what what the question is is asking and again it's I mean well as Alice just mentioned there's going to be a lot of debate this is still just the you know the proposals just opened up the the feedback the initial feedback has just closed so like with all of these things it often gives rise to more questions than answers but you know, so far, some of the feedback has been quite mixed. So obviously there's providers of value added services who need data held by manufacturers in order to develop their services that obviously have really have received this quite well, especially smaller businesses who stand to gain from some of the rights and the protections that c the commission has been quite, um, quite keen to put in place. I mean, we touched on it briefly, but, you know, some of the proposal uh, highlights potentially unfair terms that are uh, there to protect um, small uh, SMEs when they're negotiating against larger manufacturers. So, you know, all that is good news, but obviously, c conversely, and, and I think what this question is, is getting at, is manufacturers will now be assessing how the loss of control over their data that they hold might impact their market position. They may be giving away um, IP. I mean, you know, people in support of the Act have been quite, um, quite keen to suggest that companies' capacity to use the data of objects they manufacture won't be affected by this. Um, they stress that a third party selected by the user um, will compensate the manufacturer for the cost of granting access um, to, to data. So, for example, um, technical arrangements that need to be put in place to make the data available, for example, um, application programming interfaces. So, you know, there may be a commercial benefit for manufacturers that, that want to share their data. Um, it's not clear exactly what that, how that compensation uh, will be calculated. It needs to be reasonable. Um, the proposal also includes safeguards um, to prevent situations where data is used in any manner that would negatively impact on the manufacturer's business opportunities. Again, this is quite vague, but it does include reference to, you know, using data to develop a product or related service that would compete with the original data generating product or where the data is used by parties without an appropriate 
basis for use um, or uh, you know through appropriate technical protection measures so again it's it's something that's likely to be discussed there's going to be some challenges I, I definitely would have thought but an interesting question I think we will need to just watch this space on that um, just moving on because a couple of other questions have come up um, sorry let me just check Right, so this is in relation more to the interrelationship between some of the definitions that we've covered today. So would a data holder be the same as, um, will be the similar or the same as a data controller under the GDPR? Um, would either of you, Alice and Pilar, like to cover this one off? Yeah, I'm happy to cover this one. And um, it is a very interesting question. Um, as we explained earlier, the Data Act introduces this notion of the data holder. And, you know, as we said, as a, at a first glance, it does seem to correlate with the concept of a controller under the GDPR um, in that it has the legal or, you know, natural person who has a right uh, to make data available under applicable law, including personal data. However, when you read the definition fully, it also includes um, in relation to non-personal data, the party in control of the technical design of the product and related service. Um, more often than not, this would be a service provider who would not always be a controller of personal data and may not have a legal right to share any personal data. Um, it processes as part of the technical um, design service. Um, so I think that there is a bit more complexity in the chain of data flows and the relationship uh, between parties do not really correspond neatly with the roles of controller and processor under the GDPR. This also, I think, um, raises some uncertainty as to who exactly a user should be uh, requesting data from in this scenario. So, I don't know, uh, potentially a service provider in respect of non-personal data and the controller uh, for personal data. Again, uh, we'll need to watch space here. Great. Thank you so much for that, Pilar. Um, and I think we've got time for another question. So, um, as we've seen, um, the Data Act is part of a wider data strategy from the EU. Linked to that, what is the difference between the Data Act and the Data Governance Act? Would either of you like to pick that one up? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say that. So the, the Data Governance Act um, has already been agreed by co-legislators and that was back in November 2021. Um, and it is linked. So broadly speaking, what the Data Governance Act is trying to do um, is establish a framework to facilitate both general and sector specific data sharing by companies, individuals and also the public sector. And the new Data Act is linked to the Data Governance Act in that it concerns the actual rights on the access to and use of data. So, yeah, how, how it works is the Data Governance Act sets up um, the, this framework for data sharing, and then the Data Act itself clarifies who can access and create value from data and under um, which conditions. Great, thanks for that, Alice. And we've got another question in. What will be the implementation mode of the data app by member states? When in force, will it be like a directive or regulation? Well, it is a proposed regulation, um, but as Alice um, has, has already stated, um, there will be quite a lot of debate before it kind of, you know, gets approved. So I, I suppose it may change, but it, currently it's a proposed regulation. Um, so I think I'm not sure if there's any further questions. I think that may be it. Um, so I suppose just 
just in summary, we just want to thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, clearly, you know, as one of those quotes at the end says, the intention is good, but still has lots of questions. I mean, clearly, the Commission has stated that, you know, 80% of industrial data in the EU remains unused. Um, and, and they've given various reasons for this, you know, lack of clarity about who can use and access the data generated by connected products, the fact that SMEs are frequently not in a position to negotiate balanced data sharing agreements with the stronger market players. There's also barriers to switching between competitive and trustworthy cloud and edge services in the EU, as well as um, a limited ability to combine data emanating from different sectors. So clearly, the, the Commission's plans to boost innovation and competition in the EU by allowing better use of industrial data is hopefully a positive step. Um, some of the criticisms faced to date is, well, why is the Data Act any better than some of the other um, initiatives that have been put in place in the past? So, you know, there's already, for those of you that aren't aware, the EU is already funding a support centre for data sharing, um, which is a forum that can be used already. So what's to say data sharing via the Data Act will be any better? Why are we mandating at this stage? Um, other questions that, you know, it would be helpful to consider is, you know, why are we only applying this to data generated by using tangible, tangible products or related services? Why are we excluding data from any app, for example, using location data on a mobile device? I mean, all of this data is of commercial value as well, is it not? And, you know, as one of the questions today has, has highlighted, there will be a tension between, you know, the IP rights and the, the sort of the commercial benefit that manufacturers get from the data they collect versus, you know, making this more freely available. So there's certainly some tensions tensions there, but I think it's a very much a case of um, watching this space and um, we will, yeah, keep you posted with any new updates. So please do, do feel free to follow us, to join um, our next webinars. And we just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and we will end the session there. Thanks very much.